Hello, hello, it's Andy at Content Car here. Thank you so much again for tuning in to yet another monthly social media roundup. So we've got a lot to cover as usual. And to help me do that, I've got my favorite social media co-host, Luanne. So good morning, Luanne. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you. This comes around so quickly and especially at 11 o'clock, doesn't it? It's always, it gives us a couple of hours just to check in case there's anything last minute that's happened overnight before we get going. Absolutely, absolutely. And yeah, and good morning, Ruby. And yeah, Ruby knows the drill because um, we get a lot of people on these on these sessions. Hi, Sally, Caroline. So yeah, feel free to light up the chat, um, say where you're joining from. Of course, you know, like I say every week, like every week, every month, I'm like a broken record, right? Because we've all got so much to learn from each other. It becomes quite a nice community because we see lots of people returning to these every single month. So feel free to share your Instagram, LinkedIn, whatever is a, that your preference to, to be connected with, because you know, we're a, we're a team of like-minded social media folks, so we've got a lot to learn from each other. So with that, my usual caveat as well applies where we'll go through all of the updates in the usual format. We'll go through them by way of the, the data, some of the insights that we've seen over the last month, and then we'll go into the specific updates. The idea of this session is really just to help set the scene, give you a little more context around things that are happening in the world of social. Don't feel you need to do everything, jump on everything, but hopefully it gives you an opportunity to either make sure your strategies are going in the right direction or make any tweaks as required. So with that, I'm just gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen and we'll, we'll dive right into it. So let's start with uh, a bit of data. <laughs> right, so very pink slide, so bear with me on this. So this is um, Global Web Index. So this is a survey of about 200,000 uh, internet users. So as you would have seen from a lot of our presentations before, Global Web, Web Index is somewhere we, we constantly go back to, to look at some really statistically significant data. Anyway, the upshot of this is that latest research is saying that brand discovery is happening predominantly on social media. So 64% of internet users across these 200,000 people polled uh, between the ages of 16 to 64, 64% of them are going to social media channels first to discover new products and services. And whilst that's obviously very encouraging for us, but for us that are you know, doing social media for our brands or working on behalf of clients, I think the bit underneath that shows even more interesting dynamics. Of course, ads clearly are, are one of the primary ways of doing that with 28%, but underneath that, like recommendations, comments on social, you can really start to feel like the, the word of mouth element that we talk about. This is really the magic of social happening. Mm -hmm. And whilst we typically in, in social, certainly from a brand perspective, have relied heavily on ads, it's the things that happen behind the scenes, the things that are hard to measure, that typically has the biggest effect. So as you can see, the whole, whole recommendation engine really in full effect of Recommendations here at 23%, then posts or reviews from expert bloggers, so your influencer piece, endorsements by celebrities. So you can see that kind of broader recommendation, referral, advocacy piece, making up actually the biggest proportion of where brand discovery is happening. So that was the thing I took away from this that I found particularly interesting. Luan, I don't know if you have any other take on this. Um, I think I'd just like to add to your point about the, you know, the behind the scenes and while we all see a lot of public activity and posting on across social media, I advise and I personally spend more of my time, I guess, doing stuff that's not publicly visible by sending messages, responding to messages, you know, connecting with people, sending messages to people that viewed my profile or said thank you, you know, and that's where you nurture your audience and you build your relationships and you find the business opportunities. So for me, yeah, picking up on that, it, it doesn't all have to be fully visible to the millions of people on the platforms. There is a lot that goes on um, that's not visible. Mm, agree. It's not all about getting the posts that goes viral, right? It's all the stuff yeah. that happens on the Facebook groups, things that happen on Reddit, that kind of yeah. stuff. So yeah, I find that that's really the magic of social. And something that supports that is from this same report, actually, I just wanted to call this out because um, this denotes an interesting trend shift that we've been seeing over the last couple of years, but we're starting to see this play out kind of in front of us here. So it's the same audience that was surveyed. And um, what Global Web Index track is the usage of social media, the main purpose of why people come to social media, how is that usage behavior changing? 
And the, the thing that's at the top of the list shows the biggest percentile shift year over year, and it's work-related networking and research. And that I find that particularly interesting because it's it shows a pivoting away. Pivoting away is probably the wrong way of explaining it, actually. It shows the evolution of social where we're starting to use this more centrally for work. It's it's moving away from just being the place where we connect with friends and family, moving towards that place where brands start to understand the opportunity to network with a wider community. It's where people which support what we've just been talking about, it's where people are in increasingly turning to to discover or be recommended new products and services. So I find this actually some really encouraging statistics, especially when we're talking social media for business. Um, what's your take on this one, Luan? Um, yeah, you know, the, the, we, we always show stats that are, are great. And you've said before, what was it, you know, about your 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 being conscious about sharing stats that uh, that prove what we want it to say. But the, on the networking front, I think obviously over the past couple of years, social media has been our primary tool for networking because we haven't been face to face. We haven't been to those breakfast meetings and those lunch meetings. But even prior to that, as part of my my training sessions, I was having conversations with people of actually like, you know, that time spent traveling to a meeting, being in the meeting for an hour, maybe just catching up with people you already knew um, versus coming back that time could be better spent with with some online um, networking, searching LinkedIn, finding new contacts, sending messages. So I think it's something that was accelerated because of lockdowns, um, but it's a good trend to see. And I, and I hope it continues and that people do see that the social media platforms have that purpose. And it's not just about kind of broadcast posts or or advertising that it is really where, I mean, we met, that's how we met. We've never met face to face. It's, it's through kind of, mm -hmm like you said, the word of mouth and the, and the connections. And that's, uh, I think just to, to add on to this before we move on, I think that's, you're actually a really good example of this, Luan, because um, how you built your recent event, you know, the, um, your summit, which did last, last week and get 800 people to turn up to a summit, you know, you didn't run that through paid as we we're just talking about, you didn't promote it through paid, you promoted it within those, those groups and those networking communities that wanted to gain research. And I think yeah. that's, a bit of a mind shift for us as social media folk, as brands, etc. Rather than thinking of social media as a distribution platform, as, as you just mentioned, Luan, rather than thinking of like, right, I've got a message, I want to broadcast it, I want to get as many likes and stuff. You know, that's still important for sure. But think flipping it on its head a little bit, thinking about what are the communities I can work in? Who are the, where is my audience and how do I go to them? Not just by posting stuff to them, how do I ingratiate myself? with um, those communities is a hugely important yet underutilized tactic from brands from my perspective. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it takes time, but it is, yeah, so, you know, do I decide to go to my local um, breakfast networking event or do I find a Facebook group that's perhaps got 5,000 people that I, I can help, want to help, want to engage with? So, you know, these places are, are available. You just got to find them and, and then work them. Definitely agree with that. So um, something else from, from this same report as well. So I uh, had fun in this report, as you can see. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just kind of wanted to highlight this stuff, which once again goes back to the point of purpose. So based on the, the same research, uh, people were asked, what do you predominantly do on the platform? And essentially this report puts together, as you can see, the, the top three. And I've, I've highlighted the one in blue, put a blue box around the ones that all relate to uh, follow and find information about products or brands, because I'm thinking very much from a social media marketing lens here. And it's kind of interesting, um, the platforms where you can see this happening the most. We've spoken lots about Pinterest in the past, and that's the primary place that people go to brand research. So it's unsurprising we see that at number one. Instagram naturally is more product and brand friendly, as we know with, with um, LinkedIn as well. Twitter and Reddit, slightly more tricky, but still in the top three. And I kind of highlighted um, TikTok in, in orange because number one, find funny and entertaining content. And I think just because that is so clearly number one makes it very challenging for brands typically to, to have a voice in that because that creates quite a creative barrier typically. And you can see kind of uh, brand discovery not really um, rated in the top three. In, and that's the kind of interesting subtext to this because so much brand discovery is happening on TikTok, but it's embedded into that entertainment, entertaining and funny content. It's the, the take I would, I would take away from this. But yeah, interesting in what do you think, Luanne? I think this comes back to when we've looked at slides before around 
people aren't using just one platform that they are across multiple platforms and how also we're in different mindsets when we're on different platforms as well you know we are on TikTok perhaps you know for some entertainment to to waste some time because you know th there's nothing on the tv or you know it's a bit more kind of downtime we're on linkedin with a very business mindset focus but you know everything that you've highlighted shows that each and every platform has a purpose we just need to understand how it's going to work best for us mm -hmm. Absolutely agree. So social media usage data, before we go on to the, uh, the different like, tre not different trends and different features that have been added, let's look at some usage data. And I, actually, I want to exclusively focus on, uh, on some engagement benchmarks, and then we're going to look at stories. So um, I, I posted about this a couple of weeks ago, because we're starting to see some really interesting um, differentiations between the different social platforms in terms of their engagement benchmarks. We talk about engagement benchmarks quite a lot. But some of this latest data from Social Insider is showing the average TikTok engagement rate at 5.96%. So uh, I think we, we all know, but just a reminder, engagement rate is the ratio of the amount of interactions you get on your content, likes, follow, shares, clicks, et cetera, amount of interactions per the amount of people uh, reached. So that's your engagement rate. So clearly TikTok is, is doing incredibly well for that. For kind of a basis of comparison, Instagram's average engagement rate across all industries is 0.83%, uh, and Facebook's is 0.07%. So just to give you an idea of the likelihood of people to interact and engage in your content, um, that's some rather compelling uh, data that, that leads towards TikTok. Doesn't mean that everyone needs to jump on TikTok, but it does just go to show um, the impact that that's, that's having. So I don't know if there's anything else you want to add on this, Luanne. Um, it, it's all about engagement, isn't it? And I think we need to think back to when we're creating our content, what is it we want people to do? And what does that engagement mean? Is it a like because it's for awareness and visibility and getting to know us and behind the scenes? Or is it something more more tangible, perhaps something as, you know, your your weekly posts about his his this week's updates come along to our monthly webinar and and join in you know it's engagement in different ways but we really have mm -hmm. to focus on it when we're writing our content and and make it really explicit of you've just read this post this is what you need to go and do now this is what i'd like you to do um and really focus on that as well and focus on it all the time because i've for an example a client i've been working with we've we've had quite an a uh, aggressive approach to building our audience and we wanted to make sure that while we were building our audience it didn't impact on our engagement rates we didn't just try and grow um, and, and diminish that that percentage and actually because we were growing our audience in the right way um, with the right people that we wanted to engage with our engagement rate increased over time as well so you've got to think engagement when you're writing your content and measure it and keep measuring it and I think it's a really great benchmark when you're looking at your competitor set as well. Don't just go, oh, you know, competitor A has 20,000 more followers than us. You may have a yeah. far better engagement rate, and that is a much better stat to report to your board and your colleagues and, and everyone else. Yeah, definitely agree with that whole benchmarking thing. Absolutely. So um, look at some other trends that are happening, TikTok versus YouTube. We're going to look at some feature changes that have happened over the last month. And there's something very interesting playing out here. YouTube is still the kind of Gen Z go to, but as a share of audience, TikTok continues to take the share away from YouTube. Um, there's really an interesting battle playing out and we'll, we'll talk on uh, the features shortly, but with YouTube pushing heavily on shorts, basically TikTok like short form video content, and TikTok moving to 10 minute videos, uh, or the opportunity to do 10 minute videos anyway, they're starting to really kind of cross onto each other's patch. And really the, the reason why I look at this Gen Z stuff as well, because you might think, all right, well, Gen Z's not my audience. But as you know, Luann, you often talk about like, think about the influencing factors of, of your customer base, which could well be uh, other demographics. And of course, this really does point us in the direction of the future of social. So typically, um, where a younger generation will go, they'll drive growth of the platform and the adoption of the platform continues to grow and mature over time. We've seen this play out across every single social network that we now you know, view as mainstream, basically adopted by younger generations, and it brings it through uh, to becoming mainstream. So looking at this is our clue to, 
to understand where TikTok is going as a platform. So pending any kind of regulation and any challenges like that, mm-hmm. you know, can't really tell what's going to happen in the future. But the, the growth trajectory is, is telling us that even though they only have about 50% of um, YouTube's monthly active users, they're very much on a trajectory to, um, to outperform that over the fullness of time. But just uh, going on to story, so talking about things that I think all of us probably can identify with as part of our strategy. I've got two slides on this and then we're going to dive into those updates. So this was some um, interesting research from HubSpot where I want to just call out um, the first and third element of uh, this particular data. So which type of Instagram story are you most likely to tap all the way through to the end? So number one is short narrative stories with photos, videos and text. And number three is stories centered around quizzes or polls. So there were some really interesting examples of this as to content that's performed really well as as a story. So the short narratives. So this stuff at the top here. So um, really condensing your content down into something that's suited for what we class as native consumption, suited for how people consume information in a rapid fire, tapping through a story type of way. So you've made content natively for that. And that fits the mold really well. And unsurprisingly, you know, that as a content format um, is the one that is preferred by users. So mm-hmm. users still want to get that insight. They want their learnings, but they want that in a short, sharp, and concise way. So no doubt that's still a challenge to do for sure, but it's nice to know from our strategies um, what the user preference is. And then the um, number three, which is the story centered around quizzes or polls, example from HubSpot here. So there's increasing amounts of interaction that's being uh, afforded within stories. We'll talk through some updates that are happening around this uh, shortly, actually, uh, to really encourage that level of interaction. And you know, as we all talk about, encouraging audience interaction obviously encourages engagement, engagement encourages reach, reach drives awareness. So you can see how this all links. Um, so this is definitely a, a really uh, powerful tool to include in our strategies. So before we move on, on to some updates, uh, Luanne, anything you'd like to add to this? I think the thing about stories, and I know there's another part of this this research, it's, it's, you know, it's a great article, just Google HubSpot for Instagram story insights. I think it's another one of those that you've got to test and learn with all the time. You know, will people watch it all the way through to the end? But there was also another part of this blog around um, how many stories is too many? There you go. Um, how many stories will you tap through before swiping out? And and I know with one of my clients in the FMCG space, we most of our stories is actually user generated content that we're we're sharing. Um, and sometimes there's a lot, and sometimes there's not so much. And sometimes we're like, do you know what? We've got twenty stories here. Is that too many? And we've experimented with only sharing some, or or sharing sharing lots, seeing seeing what impact that makes. But actually, we've got another factor in in that test around what does it mean to our community and our followers when they get their story shared on the brand account so there's always lots of elements behind this um and you just start to think about yourself don't you and it's kind of like if i go on someone's account and they've done you know there's loads of little lines along the top am i going to watch them all um is there not you know i think it depends on your relationship with that person and and when you've watched their stories before if you know you're always going to get value you're going to keep watching it um if, if you think that it's, you know, it's just, it, it's a bit spammy, um, you're probably not going to engage all the way through. So it, it's testing, but there's some really great insights in that article about kind of what kind of story content and experiment is always the answer. Definitely, definitely. Right then, let's go on to what's new. Let's start with our yes. friends at Meta then. Yes. So um, this is interesting because you mentioned earlier about, you know, kind of building communities and where you engage and where you network and Facebook actually talked a couple of years ago about their focus on groups as being a place that they wanted people to go to. And um, and often it's if, if you're an active member of some really good groups on Facebook, it is your reason to kind of keep going back to the platform and engaging or asking your peers or or asking questions. And over the last good couple of years, you know, if not ongoing, they are really working on groups, aren't they, and providing more tools for them and i think this moderation one is probably quite useful um i know a couple of people that run some very large facebook groups they have a mod team supporting them so the more tools that they have to kind of manage the conversations um moderate them not not to kind of stop people 
commenting but you know we, we've all been in groups where they can get a little bit out of hand or 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 negative so the more power that facebook is giving to the groups the more value they're going to be for both the group owner and everyone that's in it definitely um and things like this is it a big one does it matter all it means is that anyone that presents or trains on facebook has to redo their entire slide deck um and mm. screenshot doesn't it but um we, we'll come on to a twitter update later which i'm wondering if this is connected to or just part of the, mm. the vocabulary we're using in in social media now as, as trying to build community and community management and perhaps it's just a better word for it than groups stats we love stats don't we um we love having our real stats in terms of you know what's what's happening our likes comments shares so that we can see what's um what's resonating with people first we know that reels are being rolled out from instagram onto facebook um and i quite like the fact that we're gonna have our stats in one place it saves us mm -hmm. going into different places so um yeah your in facebook and instagram real stats are now combined what else have we got? Some ads, a new new ad format for Reels. Um, we don't normally talk about tests in our monthly updates, but there's a few that are kind of we know are being tested. Facebook have taught talked about them being tested, and so therefore we, you know, they're they're in the sphere, they're just kind of in beta and will roll out. Whereas sometimes there's tests that um people spot but but may not actually happen. This is you know, sticker ads in reels. So again, it's just it's the format where they're trying to get people to go to. And if you want people to go to it, um, you're going to serve up ad content. This is a feature I really like on stories. Um, I've seen it a few times and it kind of really makes you want to, to get involved, doesn't it? Add yours. It's um, what have we seen? Kind of, you know, what's the last photo in your in your um, camera? Um, where were you when, you know, we first went into lockdown? You know, share a picture of this. I think it's a really nice interactive way. It's, it's something that when you have a really clear prompt on something to do, it makes it easy for you to get involved, which ultimately is actually how TikTok grew um, with their challenges, um, what got people involved. So the more you can say to people, do this, um, get involved by being really specific. Um, yeah, I've loved it on stories. So the fact that Facebook are now adding it as, as a sticker, I think we're going to see more of those. Yeah, definitely. I think that's it goes back to that point we were talking about um, with, with that stories data, right? Because users want to mm -hmm. have stories where they can participate with. And it's it's that audience involvement, the audience participation piece that is, is such a critical element to engineer into our social content because people want to talk about themselves. They want to feel seen, heard, connected with, right? Yeah. We all do. So yeah. um, it's, this is super powerful. And I think it's it's changing the kind of parameters for how we should be looking to drive engagement not just looking for a like or a click for example yeah. really encouraging much more participation i think this is going to be the kind of the new expected behavior um mm -hmm. but anyway more about that later on but let's go to a bit of instagram stuff the chronological instagram feed uh it's back to you know much users desire of like oh right they've got people feel like they have more control of their Instagram feed, but it's it's kind of not really as good as it sounds because what Instagram have added is the ability to customize your feed to both a following and a favorites. So um, as the name suggests, you can start to customize your feed basically on those that you are following and have a chronological feed thereof, or you can have up to 50 favorites uh, that you just wanna see the content from. Now, this very much helps uh, us as individuals have a better, Instagram experience. The main issue amongst all of this is that this is a feature that is not, uh, you can't save it basically. So the default, whenever you open Instagram, will be back to the kind of algorithmic based recommendation feed where Instagram is sharing with you the content that's most, you're most likely to engage with. So will this, will we need to change our strategies? I don't think so personally, because the majority of Instagram users won't know to do this and simply won't think to do this every time you open an app because quite simply you really don't want that as a user experience having to change your experience so i think this is a bit of a kind of fake news story if you will and this is more instagram placating the, the critics i would say um maybe i sound too negative luann i don't know if you've got another take on it uh, it's one of those things that they say that people have been demanding for a long time isn't it and you know there's often often features that people talk about that they really want um 
like the edit button on Twitter. We're never going to get that, but it does look like Instagram have given people what they want. It's nice. I wonder whether there's something in here for brands to be doing some messaging around, please favor us. Um, you know, are we one of your favorites so that you make sure that you're pinned so that if people do start to have their, you know, their feeds personalized for them, that actually we we try and make sure that we are one of those those favorites. Maybe it's quite good thinking. Um, Instagram, I'll close in the um, Instagram TV standalone app. We know that Instagram TV is going away, uh, but yeah, Instagram is very much still pivoting to video, but it's all going to be in the feed. So in the Instagram feed, like you can do a, a 60 minute video will still be able to be added into the feed, which actually is just a better user experience. So Instagram video, very much friends, but Instagram TV is, is gone. Ads have gone. Standalone app is being retired. So, uh, but Insta video is very much what we should be focusing our strategy around. Um, auto captions for feed videos. So once again, leading on that, uh, importance of video because let's not forget Instagram's own statement of intent for the direction of their business is to be a video first entertainment app. I think we should all be very cognizant of that whenever we're building our Insta strategies. Uh, but this is brilliant for accessibility. So automatic automated captions for your feed videos. Moderation for Instagram live streams. Um, as you might remember from a few months ago, we spoke about um, on Facebook and Instagram, live streams are responsible for 50 and 70% respectively of the engagement growth on the platforms. Live streams are the single content format that generates the most interactions across any content format. Um, and as a result, all of the platforms are adding lots of extra functionality around live streams. This is a really important one because you can choose, let's just say Luann and I were, were doing this as an Instagram live, then I could choose a Luann as a moderator to, to check out the chat, et cetera, because it's a very stressful experience having to manage chat whilst you're live streaming. So this is a brilliant update. Um, scheduled sticker for Instagram stories. So this relates to your uh, upcoming lives, allows you to, um, promote them in your stories through that scheduled sticker. People can click on that and see the upcoming events you have going on. And you can also do a bit of a countdown as to where, uh, when your events are happening, a brilliant way of promoting your events. Once again, leaning in on um, Instagram's uh, preference for lives. So might be one to, to think about for everyone. Creator tags, really useful. I mean, we can always tag individuals in content, but now we've got more con context behind that. So we can now tag the contribution Con contributors on the content by their contribution. So here we've got an example of like tagging the musician, tagging the stylist, um, tagging whomever has contributed to that content. So recognizing the people that we've co-created content with. And, you know, as I say, like a broken record every single month, you know, co-creating content together is really the, the way that we'll all succeed in raising each other's profiles on, on social. So I think it's a very important thing. So everyone gets recognized. Talking of tags, this is product tags. They're available to all. So were previously limited to Instagram accounts over a certain follower, follower count rather, uh, but now uh, everyone has the ability to tag products. This really leans in on Instagram's desire to facilitate creator monetization. It's really gonna allow even more kind of micro and nano influencers, if you will, uh, to come to the fore to start representing brands. And of course, here you've got more control as a brand to choose whether you want to have your products tagged in posts. And also you can have a, a feed as to where you've been tagged. Amazing for user generated content, because as we know, if we could all fill our feeds with just user generated content, I know I certainly would, because it's absolutely more powerful than, than anything that we could say and put our feeds ourselves. So I think this is super powerful particularly, of course, in the, in the B2C world, but also think this is going to potentially be useful for B2B, especially in that whole user-generated context, being able to, and people being able to tag the products that they're using, for example, can be super powerful. Instagram subscription sticker. So whilst this one's a test, I want to call this one out because going back to the whole creator monetization thing, the broader creator economy, all of the, the platforms are falling over themselves to try and help creators monetize on the platform because if they enable creator monetization, they bring more creators to the platform, more creators create more content, create more community, get people spending longer on the platform, more ad inventory for the uh, the relevant platform to, to serve. So 
Um, that's really why they want to focus on these creators and hence the reason you're seeing things like subscription stickers. So the view being here very much the same on like Twitter blue, which is Twitter's subscription service where people who are super fans of a certain creator can subscribe to get exclusive access to things. So that is a test, but it's very much going to come. And then here, we can... sorry, carry on. Sorry, I'm just wondering whether the, the, you know, that subscription option and Twitter blue and everything else is going to make or needs to make us think about our content in terms of levels of content. It's a bit like that kind of gated and ungated on your website. What, what am I prepared to give away for free? And can I give enough away for free that people go, oh, there's real value in this person or this brand's content. I'm happy to, to, to pay a bit of money and to subscribe and um, to, to get the next level. So I think it's, there's a real content decision here. And if we are going to go down wanting people to subscribe and pay, we've, we've actually kind of got a, a program of activity to do to show that value to, to when we're ready to monetize it, because it's not going to just happen overnight. So I think we're going to have to start thinking about levels of value add in our content too. Yeah, it's a good call out actually, definitely agree. But, and, and to that point as well, which kind of talks to that subscriber thing is that um, yeah. they're working on the ability just to share uh, reels to certain subscribers as well. So that kind of exclusive content that you're talking about is very much kind of being facilitated within the platform. And uh, they're also looking at adding the add your sticker for reels. It's available on stories as we know. Um, but like I said, this is this whole kind of add yours and collaborative contribution um, element of social is going to be ubiquitous all, across all the platforms. So it's it's interesting when whenever we notice a trend like this, where lots of the similar types of moves are being made across multiple different channels, you can start to see the direction of travel. So that's definitely something that we should be cognizant of in our strategies as to how we encourage that that participation. Over to you for Twitter. <laughs> So Twitter, they've been doing a lot on spaces, haven't they, over the last 12, 24 months and adding new features all the time. And, and I like this one. So this is where Twitter is allowing you to do a 37, 30 second clip from your spaces conversations, from your spaces chats, and then be able to kind of share those out as well, which I think is is nice for, you know, as we do for, for these kind of things, you know, join us. Here's a 30 second clip. Did you miss it? Um, here's a 30 second clip. Keep people engaged kind of before and after. I think it's still in test and it's iOS only at the moment, but just just that whole repurposing content and driving, you know, driving as, as we have, you know, and a huge thank you. We have, you know, people that will, will regularly attend and, you know, just to kind of keep keep the conversation and the content going between sessions. I think this is really valuable for. Analytics for spaces as well. Don't we want analytics? You know, we need to know how it's doing, who's engaging, who's coming along, what, what our stats are. So we've now got those on the platform. Monetization, again, kind of a bit like the, the Instagram subscription and Twitter have been talking about this for a long time and, and really pulling out that word creator as well. That's definitely come into our, our dialogue over the last few months as well. You know these platforms creating opportunities for creators, encouraging people to see themselves as creators, create that value add, and then enabling them to monetize it as well. So we've now got a dashboard to, to see those payouts. If anyone is monetizing Twitter, I'd love to hear um, some examples of, of people doing that. Definitely, I agree with that. Shops, this is the first shopping one today. We have talked about live shopping, um, you know, maybe, it's died down a bit after Christmas. It will it will come back towards later in the year. All these features to enable um, shopping directly from the social media platforms. Um, Twitter's got on board with it now in the US. This is really interesting as well from a from a customer service point of view. Um, I do I do some work with with contact centres in terms of using social media, and now you know we're going to have to engage with people while these shops are open and and be driving having more e commerce conversations and perhaps you know making recommendations so it's not just about the features to you know promote shops and products but how we engage with the audience as they interact with it as well alt text so this is um accessibility i'm having more and more conversations with clients about accessibility making sure that your your content is accessible not just in color contrast and font size but images and this alt text update on twitter i think is really important as well Yes, it does add, you know, 
another thing that we need to do when we post, but it's increasingly important. Um, so being able to add descriptions to our images as we post them on Twitter for those that perhaps, you know, have, have some sort of disability to be able to engage more on social media, it, it's best practice and we've got to be doing it. Agreed. Communities. This is where I said, you know, have Facebook changed, changed their word groups to communities at the same time as Twitter are building theirs out? It may just be a coincidence. Um, does it help that we have the same language across the platforms? I don't know. But communities is quite a big change to Twitter, isn't it, in terms of, you know, building groups, having group community conversations. I understand that it's still at trial stage and that there's been some capacity issues in communities. It kind of brings me a little bit back to, to Google Plus and circles in a way of being able to kind of have closed group conversations. So, you know, are we going full circle on some features? But ultimately, it's another great tool to engage, to engage with our followers. Definitely. It's getting rolled out further and further. So um, my kind of guidance here typically is if, if you already have some form of following on, on Twitter, um, this could be a good one to start looking into and uh, not necessarily jumping straight away because the, uh, the next thing actually is particularly useful as well for starting to get involved with those communities. So I'll hand that back over to you, Luan. Thank you. Um, so, and just discoverability, you know, isn't it all about, you know, you've built this community, will people come? Actually, we need to be able to search and we need to be able to find them. So it's showing us how social media platforms are you know, search engines within their own right, and we need to be visible. And this is how people are going to find these communities as well. So maybe an action from today, we don't very often give you actions, but maybe this is something that you could all take away and, and just go and check this one out and see what you can find. Definitely. And um, podcasts, we've talked about audio a lot. Um, I'm coming on to LinkedIn in, in a minute. And we mentioned this last month, Twitter and podcasts, it's in test. So um, this really is about that massive growth in podcasting audio as a format and twitter are getting in the space as well we actually have loads of linkedin updates um this month and some of them have been over the last few days as well and i'm really quite excited um about some of these as, as many mm. of you know if you follow regularly you know i'm a an avid um linkedin uh user and and work for the platform in terms of creating content and courses new LinkedIn post insights. This is about if you have a creator account, you will be now getting more post insights. Um, I think this is kind of rolling out imminently. Um, so, so keep an eye out for it. This means you're going to be able to see more in depth about who's reading your posts. Search for that by location, by job title, by industry. Um, break down those reaction types by likes and you know celebrate and, and support. And for me, these kind of post insights, which we've had a little bit for a while, but it looks like these are going to be much more in depth. This is about you being able to look and see if your content is resonating with the right people. It's all very well having a great number of views, but if all my views were from a country that I, I don't work in, I don't um, have any presence in and no opportunities in or industries that I'm not currently engaging with, um, then my content isn't reaching the right people. So for me, it's a it's a sense check, but also a way to identify new opportunities. If I suddenly saw there was a, a different location where everyone's seeing my content or a different job title, I may be able to kind of produce some content targeted to that, that, that area or, or be more active in that area as well. So I love that we're getting more, more, more data, I want more data. Yeah, if only all the all the platforms allowed us to see which or specific audience we're engaging with our content, we'd be in a good place. So well yes, done, LinkedIn. Um, company pages and newsletters. So newsletters have been around for a while. Um, not everyone had them. They were rolling out. Again, they're a feature of a creator account. If you change your LinkedIn profile to a creator account, that's one of the benefits. Um, Newsletters are now available for company pages. They rolled out articles for company pages just a few weeks, months ago. Yeah. Um, now it's on company pages, which is which is great. It doesn't look hugely different from an article, um, but you can get your followers to subscribe and a newsletter goes straight into people's inboxes. One note yeah. on this, and you will see this in your notifications tab, just like when um, Creator opened it up to individuals, we su suddenly saw a big flurry of newsletters. We're seeing that this week as they roll it out to company pages. 
think first what you want to produce. Do you need a newsletter? How often it's going to be? What value are you going to add? But something that you are also going to need to do is to build your company page following as well. So yes. I've actually put this into one of my clients' plans that we're going to launch their newsletter in about three months' time because that's going to give us three months' time to invite our connections to the company page, to build our company page content up even more in terms of the value add before we go out with a, a bigger piece of value add content in terms of a newsletter. We're going to build towards it rather than, than doing it overnight and, and actually only hitting a smaller number of people. We want to, to build and then, and then go for it. But really pleased to see this one. Makes a lot of sense. Um, live sponsoring. So again, LinkedIn Live been around for a long time in beta, been testing. You may have it now if you've got that creator account. If not, you need to apply for it. There is criteria around you having access to LinkedIn Live. Um, that's related to your current content. It's related to your audience size and how frequently you use the platform. But you now can sponsor um, your LinkedIn Lives, your events, so you can advertise them before you do it. Um, Lives on LinkedIn, a bit like Facebook and Instagram, you know, they do get a lot of engagement while you're live. Um, if, you, if you promote it and you've got an, an engaged audience, but you also get that content kind of in the next few hours of people watching it on, on replay. So another great feature. And LinkedIn are adding more features around their ads as well. So it's good to see this coming into the, to the toolkit. Those updates, those invites to follow. So this one i think is around the company page and making it easier to invite your connections to follow your company page it was limited i think to 100 invites a month i believe it's now 250 um so think about that as part of your ongoing activity i've never been a huge fan of company pages think that they needed to be there and a content hub for larger organizations but with the functionality that linkedin is adding to the company page um, you probably don't need it if you're a freelancer, if I'm honest, if, if you're a business of kind of one to five. But anything more than that, use your company page and build it um, and build it up over time. Career breaks. This is this is often a question when we're building out our LinkedIn profile and more that CV part of it, the experience section. And, and often get asked, you know, I've had a career break. Um, maybe in the past you've been traveling maybe um, to, to start and raise a family. There's been reasons why you haven't um, been in a, in a business role. Um, COVID over the last two years, you may have been furloughed, you know, redundancies have happened. LinkedIn have now made it easier to include those career breaks and make them transparent and, and to normalize them, that it's okay to have had a career break. So um, I think that's a great addition to the, the profile setup. Podcasting network. I briefly mentioned it last month. It kind of coincides with with Twitter doing this as well. This is a bit more like a hosting um, situation that LinkedIn are doing at the moment. So if you already have a podcast, um, you have an established audience, you have an established kind of program of content, you can talk to LinkedIn about kind of adding it to their podcast network. So at the moment, they're mainly doing this with their influencer network, their LinkedIn course instructors, and I imagine it will roll out even further over time. Yeah, I think this is going to be a, a fantastic <laughs> opportunity, particularly for like B2Bs to, uh, to gather more in-depth engagement on their on their content, because I think, yeah, podcasting and just social audio fits with LinkedIn better probably than any other social platform. Um, I'm hoping that they'll come up with some updates on their, their social audio piece as well, which would link into podcasting as well, but they've gone a bit quiet on that. Anyway. <laughs> um, LinkedIn, the LinkedIn partner marketing community, you may have seen this um, as, a, as an update. They have launched this. It's basically a LinkedIn group. Um, I joined it when, it when it launched. I will share. I had a quick look at it this morning just to see what was happening. There's about 2,000 people in a LinkedIn group at the moment. It is for marketers to share. Dare I say it, LinkedIn groups aren't overly active. Um, there's not a huge amount going on there. But if you want to be part of the community as it builds, um, do just search for this, this LinkedIn group um, and, and you'll start to get some content through. Right then. TikTok. Well, let's do it. Well, for Normal, five, normal last five minutes of our of our session. I'm going to go through the the other social channels. There's not too many new updates across the others. So whilst yeah, you head off to to the comments and questions for the final five minutes, I'll run through the updates from TikTok, Pinterest, Clubhouse, and beyond. 
So as I said earlier, TikTok 10 minute videos are coming. So it's not available to everyone, but it's gonna be uh, rolling out very soon. Um, this is very much something gonna be interesting to watch. It allows us a bit more creative freedom for sure, because longer form content is easier to do typically than the micro content, short form content. So this provides us a more opportunity. Um, how well that this will be taken up on, on TikTok, only time will tell. Um, because, you know, Luan raised the point earlier about like the, the kind of mindset that people are in when they come to a platform. TikTok is bite size, it's you fire through that content. And this kind of just, go to show some, there's some underlying challenges that are within TikTok and those challenges relate to creator monetization. Because typically creators make the most money from all the platforms, they make the most money out of YouTube. They make the most money out of YouTube because on YouTube you run pre-roll, mid-roll and the end of an ad at the end of the video. So YouTube have a brilliant advertising strategy to allow creators to make good money, so 50% of all of the advertising revenue, 45% of the advertising revenue that's generated on YouTube is shared with the creator. On TikTok, they can't do that because they don't have ads that run on videos. They all they have, or all they have is a $200 million creator fund, but that's split across so many creators. That means that it's really hard for creators to make any meaningful money on TikTok. And there's a kind of growing um, discontent with TikTok creators that they're just simply not getting paid enough. Um, 10 minute videos is a way to help embed more ads uh, within those videos and embed more ads within those experiences to help uh, recognize creators more for their money. And I think, yeah, it's very hard to monetize short form content as opposed to long form. So that's the kind of underlying challenge of TikTok. It's an interesting one to watch. Talking of audience interaction, participation, engagement, we've been talking about polls, you know, pretty standard stuff coming to TikTok. Um, so once again, useful features that we're seeing from other platforms go into TikTok because TikTok have done a lot of their innovation and now they're looking at kind of, now they're becoming a mainstream social platform. They're starting to bring in all of the other uh, tools and techniques that are used by the other platforms to drive growth. So we're going to start to see TikTok normalize a lot over the next kind of six to 12 months where they're bringing in the features from other platforms and as a result, it's gonna make TikTok a more of a comfortable platform uh, for others that are more familiar with the other social platforms, more of a comfortable platform to get engagement with. What relates to that perfectly is the fact uh, TikTok stories are coming. It's still in test, but they've been you know, continually rolling out. Some users in the UK and the US are now reporting to, to see this now. So it looks like it's very much coming and it looks exactly like uh, you would expect a stories experience to look. Uh, you can now also schedule your TikToks from the desktop as well. So for those that are doing TikTok and obviously have the um, same challenges as we all do, which is publishing things at the right time. Um, I'm experimenting lots with TikTok publishing time. I seem to think that evenings seem to be a little bit better, but uh, this gives you an opportunity to experiment more with that. Uh, TikTok's also given you analytics and the amount of saves as well. You know, very similar stuff to what we have with uh, Instagram. So just a little bit more data from, from TikTok. Pinterest, uh, they're going full e-commerce. So we haven't spoken much about social commerce, but and we've spoken lots in the past, however, about Pinterest views on social commerce because we know that's the number one reason, as we said earlier, that people come to Pinterest is to research brands, products, etc. Uh, so now they're working and they're about to launch a fully kind of e-com experience whereby you won't have to leave the platform to purchase products from a certain vendor. So a really good experience there. YouTube shorts analytics uh, are coming. So, you know, don't say anything more about that. But as shorts develops, it's had five trillion views in total of all of the shorts so far. So it's seemingly gaining more and more traction. And once again, live streaming is one of those trends that we're noticing. You know, we saw that trend about the ad your sticker appearing in more and more places. We're seeing also the trend about increasing tools around live streaming. We're knowing this is the direction of travel. And when we see uh, networks following each other and doing similar things, we know that they're going to be promoting uh, these content formats uh, kind of unfairly, if you will, positively unfairly. So um, as you can see, live streaming, once again, really big on, on YouTube. If you've used YouTube recently, you'll see a lot of the live streams kind of appearing at the top of the feed. So they're improving discoverability of these. So as you can see in the kind of little um, widgets here, the little avatars. So it's becoming easier to see when someone's going live and now you can have multiple guests. 
Uh, we saw this in last month's update from Instagram, where you can now have like a multi-party with up to four guests. We can now do the same on YouTube. And once again, talks to like the collaboration of content, talks to the power of live streaming being one of the, the most engaging content formats. Uh, one on Reddit, they've improved just in the same way that we were talking about um, Twitter's community discovery tools. Um, they've now launched this on Reddit as well. Brilliant way to find those communities uh, to work with. Reddit communities are, are some of the, I would say, the most vibrant and some of the most intelligent conversation happens within Reddit. And that really talks to the point that we started today's session with. It's like social media is not always about you know, creating content and distributing it far and wide. That is an element of it. It's a part of social. Um, but when we're talking about how actual influence happens, influence happens behind the scenes, as we we're saying, within those communities, et cetera. So um, this is why like discovering those communities, finding those you can be part of first and then work with secondary. So build relationships with the people that run the community, create uh, relationships with them that make them you know, inclined to share your content and, and represent your, your brand or business, whatever it might be. And with that, how we do for time? 51 minutes. Right. I think we'll call it there. So in summary, six trends. Social media usage, fueling more purchase intent. From what we saw right at the start of this, this session, the way that people are using social platforms are increasingly becoming brand centric. 64% of brand discoveries happening on social, so much of that's being driven through influence, whether it's working with influencers or celebrities or word of mouth recommendations. So, uh, and increasingly uh, more of us are going to social media to, to fuel our work lives as well, whether it's networking or research. Growth of TikTok engagement, you know, it's it's six times what Instagram is. So there's huge opportunities on TikTok. There is an undercurrent, however, as we're talking about in the creator monetization where creators aren't making enough money from TikTok at the moment. So naturally that might well, over the period of time, pull creators and as a result, communities into different platforms. So definitely one to watch because fundamentally, as we've seen with the subscriptions, on Instagram that are due to come. We've seen the super follows and the kind of creator dashboard on Twitter. Creator monetization is driving the direction of social. So that's why we, we talk about it a lot. Even if you wouldn't identify with yourself as being a creator, looking what the platforms are doing around creators, because fundamentally the platforms will fall over themselves to give the tools and the monetization opportunities to these creators to bring them to the platform. That's why we pay particular attention to that. Twitter doubling down on social order, audio and communities. That's really where we're going to see a lot of the growth around Twitter spaces. If you logged into Twitter recently, you'll see the primary call to action is to go into spaces. I expect there's going to be a lot more improvements around discoverability of those and communities will continue to grow. Um, continued growth of live streaming. We've spoken about this. Don't need to go into that anymore. And the new tools that audience participation engagement. Uh, the rules are changing um, for social, like likes and comments will start to evolve more into the collaboration, whether it's through polls, whether it's through add yours, whether it's through stitching, whether it's through duets, whether it's through remixing. All of that stuff creates a new paradigm for engagement and that presents both new challenges and new opportunities for brands. And with that, that is us. So uh, a couple of kind of calls to action, also do the questions in a second. Um, you can follow all the latest updates because um, Luann is, is very good. She never really talks about her, her site. Uh, so yeah, Lighthouse Social, um, all of the social media updates. If you just want to like check in and get your, your hit of social media updates whenever you want to, you know, she keeps her website really nicely up to date to so recommend that. Um, if you want to subscribe to those like weekly updates we talk about, um, you can kind of subscribe to that on, on my website here. Um, and with that, oh yeah, also I wrote a book. So um, yeah, so that's been my last three months. So that is also on, on Amazon and all the proceeds of that uh, support UNICEF's work in Ukraine. So you can go ahead and find that on Amazon if you want to talk about, if you want, if you want to go deeper into social media strategy, particularly if you're a B2B. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing. Do we have any questions? Um Congratulations on the book, Andy. It's not it's not easy. So you've done it amazing, and it's a great book. So I do recommend it. Um, some questions and some and some comments that I'll I'll kind of just just run through. So a few people have kind of asked, you know, can we cover Twitch? Can we talk about business manager changes? Um, 
we can't possibly cover every single platform and every single thing that is happening um, across all the management tools as well. But we do try and pack as much as we both possibly can about what's really going on in, in the world of social media. Um, sometimes the data is B2B, sometimes it's B2C. We just try and um, bring you the latest stuff and, and, and what we're doing. So um, any recommendations we, we'd love. We do do this every month, but um, we, we won't be able to possibly cover everything. Um, someone asked about councils um, and information specific to council. If you're on free day tomorrow, you could join me on my social media and public sector course. Um, if not, send me a send me a message, get in touch with me because as part of the course I'm running tomorrow, I've got a case study with Cheltenham Borough Council and how they've been using um, LinkedIn um, and growing their audiences specifically in, in Cheltenham. If not, do search out Helen Reynolds and Comms Creative. She is an excellent trainer and does a lot of work with council specifically and has a lot of case studies and stories on her website. Someone mentioned about um, when we said about the Instagram and the chronological feed and adding them to favourites, um, would we get notified? I don't believe we would and I probably wouldn't want to get notified because hopefully lots of people would be favouriting. Um, but perhaps again, it's something that you could think about in terms of engagement of, you know, have you favourited us, um, make it into an engaging engaging posts so that people let you know when they've done it. A question about LinkedIn business pages, how relevant are they and data? Um, there is still a mix. Someone talked about managing their MD's profile and is that the right way to go? Um, I've shared in the chat a link to a webinar that I did about 18 months ago on really a deep dive into your LinkedIn profile data and what that means. I personally think that that's going to be more valuable when you're looking at individuals, which is where the power of LinkedIn is. I would also say that company page data for me is quite skewed because all of your employees follow your company page. Um, so it depends on the size of your your organization and particularly for universities, that's skewed by not only all of their staff, but all of their students that add it as a place of education to their profile as well. So company page data, I'm sure is going to get added to. But for me, it's quite top level at the moment and not necessarily about the content as such. And I think people are just asking where they can buy the book, Andy, but someone's helpfully, but it's great that you all answer each other's questions in the chat as we're going as well. So a lot of the questions had also been answered by you. Right, so, uh, Stefan's also asked a question um, about, um, he's, in, he's in B2B and uh, asking whether, uh, whether TikTok is a suitable platform um, when the business sells packaging machines. And well, honestly, um, I think sometimes we we think about this from the wrong perspective when we think about whether our business suits social, because we typically think from a business first lens, because that's how we've been taught to think as marketers, right? We go, right, well, here's my message that I want to share and what platform should I share it on? But I think if we, if we flip our thinking to what our audience are interested in, what's What's the things that would potentially entertain them? Because let's think about TikTok. And we, when we look at the number one reason that people come to the platform, funny, entertaining, orientated content, then kind of reverse engineer your content around that. Because there is, there is a number of different angles you can take. And I would recommend just, if you go onto TikTok and you search like other B2B businesses that you think is kind of like a little bit boring, like financial advisors or accountancies, there's there's some brilliant like if even if you look at like Sage's TikTok for example or QuickBooks or something like that yeah. and it's those things you start to realise actually it suddenly opens up your possibility because anything I describe here is quite hard to tangibly think about but yeah look at those those accounts look at I know they're a much bigger organisation but look at Zoom what Zoom are doing on on TikTok and yeah. it's just informational stuff but packaged in a really entertaining light way that's kind of native for TikTok consumption yeah it requires a bit of creativity but sometimes all creativity needs is that spark watch a watch a few accountants a few financial advisors a few other you know search packaging machines on TikTok them I bet you there'll be some people talking about stuff already there's, there's it's one for everyone so um look at that get inspired by it but I don't believe anything doesn't have a place on TikTok provided it's legitimate and legal, obviously, but like um, that there's nothing that doesn't have a place on any platform. It's just how we think about our audience first, 
and then how we make sure we engineer our content to suit the, the type of content consumption, whether it's entertainment led, whether it's kind of research led. That would be my take on it. What about, what about you, Luan? Um, I agree, you, you know, if I ever work with manufacturers, the first thing I ask is, can I come to the factory? Can I have a look around? Can I see how this works? I want to see, you know, I want to see this stuff and, and, and how it happens. And, you know, some of the greatest TikTok accounts are those real behind the scenes and the real geeky data stuff. So just, just have a look. Don't think that your content is too niche um, for something. But at the same time, as much as we're encouraging you to do it, don't think that you've got to do everything or take on board all these features that we share every month. This is about a balance of your resources, your time, your objectives. Um, we're just trying to share share what's happening and, and updates and, and ideas with you. So um, I think we're almost bang on time. And Andy, yeah, we'll do it again next month, shall we? End of April. Ready Let's do it again. Yeah, so uh, yeah, you've got the, yeah, the update there. Um, you'll see that uh, live. So just click that to, to register for, for April. And yeah, as, as we said, we'll be, we'll be talking about things throughout the course of the week, both on our kind of own personal channels, etc. But otherwise, um, as a, oh, Richard said, I put the wrong link in. Did I do the check, wrong link? That's check our, link, right. our LinkedIn post later. We'll put the right link in. Find us both on LinkedIn and we'll put the right, right link up. Yeah, hold on. I'm, I, I will get this right, actually, it. because um, yeah, what a fail, actually. So you can watch me failing in real time. Hold on. Let me just do this properly. Um, what were we saying about the potential of, of lives? You know, um, here we go. This is this is the downside. There we go. Let me just pop this in. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> I'm an idiot. Um, OK. Amongst yourselves. <laughs> there you go. Sorry about the call to action on that one. Just says register. But there you go. There's April. And plus, you're going to get an email update with all of the slides, all of the takeaways, and the link to this anyway. But yeah, just for but just for simplicity, you've got the link there. Otherwise, um, sorry we ran two minutes over. That's entirely on me. Uh, thank you so much, as always, for, for taking the time. I know this is a long session. Loads of people commit a huge amount of time uh, to joining this session. So yeah, thank you for, from the bottom of my heart to, to do this. So um, have a great uh, rest of the week, whatever's left of it. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, same time next month. Great. Take care, Thanks. everyone. Bye. Bye.